Dr. Rogers again with surgical and non-surgical approaches to managing the shock. Thank you. And so our learning objectives, we want to explore the common non-surgical and surgical approaches to treating shock or flip and uh, identify patients who are, are candidates for shock or flip. So, uh, uh, the Charcot foot is named after Jean Martin Charcot, who, uh, who also has some other diseases that, that bear his eponym, which causes confusion sometimes with patients um, who are looking these things up on the internet. But uh, it's, what I want to point out is in the first paper that he wrote in 1868, uh, this was on Tibetic arthropathies, at the very end, he, and, you know, we're in Canada, and some of you speak French, but at the very end he wrote Sarah Continue, which is to be continued in French because he said we, we still have a lot to learn about this condition. Now I'll tell you it's it's uh, you know almost 160 years later and we still have a lot to learn uh, about the shark of foot and um, and so we we put together a, the uh, international task force that was a, a joint uh, task force with the American Podiatric Medical Association and the American Diabetes Association. We met in uh, in Paris, France, in the uh, the La Salle Petrier Hospital with um, a list of, of, I think we have maybe 25 people invited, about 18 uh, came to the to the meeting, and these are Charcot Foot experts from around the world. Uh, I think we had uh, seven or eight countries represented. And, uh, and then at the hospital where Charcot did his work, uh, even, even reviewing some of his original um, works and, uh, and drawings. And, uh, and so uh, I'm gonna go through some of the task force recommendations on uh, uh, a little bit on diagnosis, but uh, concentrating specifically on non-surgical and surgical management. So, um, just to recap the, uh, the pathogenesis, and, and we, we heard a nice uh, synopsis of, of uh, a more modern theory on the pathogenesis with, with Rank L and OPG uh, from, um, from uh, one of the speakers this morning. Uh, the, uh, in, in a more rudimentary fashion, there was the French theory and the German theory. Uh, the French theory was a, a neurovascular theory, the, the uh, German theory was neurotraumatic, and, and we really kind of accept both those theories together now. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a combination of um, denervation and autonomic denervation and trauma that's leading to this, uh, this uh, uh, cycle of, of, of repetitive trauma that's going on in the foot that's causing the, the dislocation uh, in, in the sharp of foot. So um, the most important thing is that the, uh, the sharp of foot starts out as a, an inflamed foot. And so anytime you see a hot, red, swollen foot in the presence of, of diabetes and, and neuropathy, it should be sharp of foot until proven otherwise, and uh, and so we should we should start with uh, some of the, uh, the the more urgent treatments for this because this is a medical emergency and it has been written in a few articles about you know what is the definition of a medical emergency and how sharp of foot meets that definition because you, we have an opportunity to intervene and and uh, and alter the natural course here and ultimately prevent a uh, a disastrous. Uh, dislocation from happening, which can happen in a matter of days once uh, once sharp foot uh, once the inflammation starts. But um, inflammation is a is a uh, major component of of the sharp foot. Uh, it's uh, also um, involved in is the effect of the Achilles tendon. Diabetes has uh, some some direct effect on both the muscles and the tendons. Uh, the, the Achilles tendon has been studied both in uh, in patients with uh, Charcot and, and diabetic neuropathic controls, and found um, by electron microscopy there are some some unique uh, characteristics of the Achilles tendon that are that result in reduced elasticity. Uh, and uh, and you can see here in this X-ray that uh, the heel isn't even touching the ground. What we have is a is uh, the, the forefoot and the midfoot uh, with a lot of pressure, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that's leading to the dislocation at the, uh, at the midfoot, which is the most common location and the most common site of dislocation. So here's another patient uh, that, that uh, is standing on a, um, an ultrasound. We're doing a study here to increase the fat pad, uh, but the patient standing on the ultrasound, you can see the heels off the ground, and, uh, and that's because you can even see the, the darkness of the Achilles tendon pulling there on the posterior tuber of the calcaneus. And, and just the component of the quinus, which means uh, 
uh, which, which uh, comes from equine, from horses, from walking on their toes. Uh, and, that's, and that component of a tight Achilles tendon has to be addressed in, in any type of management of the sharp or foot. So we've studied these people, uh, and this is back when, that when Dr. Najafi was, at, uh, was in uh, Chicago and had the gate lab. And uh, we, we studied these people in the, in the gate lab to do dynamic peak plantar pressures. And, uh, and you can see um, how, how much pressure, this is in the midfoot actually, it looks kind of like the heel, but it's only because the heel's not touching the ground, but how much pressure is, uh, is in the midfoot when, where it's not supposed to be. And that, that's what leads to these, uh, these ulcerations. So I mentioned about thermometry for uh, the detection of, of risk for diabetic foot ulcers, but we also use thermometry and thermography to um, diagnose sharp and foot and compare temperatures between the two feet and also to track whether or not uh, what we're doing is working. Uh, this is one of the earlier thermal imagers that we had. I, I remember we got this, it was about uh, a $15,000 grant. Uh, now you can buy one for about $250, uh, made by the same companies, Fluke and FLIR. Uh, they attach to your iPhone or your Android, and you can take a picture with your phone, and you get these beautiful pictures uh, of, of feet that are, that are thermographic images. This is, the, this is one of the first things I did with it. I always, you know, when I get a new, new toy, a new medical toy, I always take it home, and I either practice on my kids or on, you know, something else at home. So I take this thing home, take it in the basement, shut off all the lights, it takes two images at the same time, a visual image and an infrared image. This is the visual image that there's no lights on, so, but it marks the hottest thing in the room, and uh, which happens to be the eyeball of my cat, you know, at 95.5 degrees. But when we look at feet, uh, we can see um, a big difference in the temperature between feet with, a, with an active sharp foot. So uh, um, this is a 10 degree difference here, 89 uh, degrees to 79 degrees. And, uh, and we want to see when we have normalization of temperatures uh, to help patients uh, return back to um, protected footwear uh, at that point. Um, we're also using this to, to see whether cryotherapy is working. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, of potential new targets for Sharpo foot, uh, one of which might be um, uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors, which is a small <laughs> study that's being done looking at, since this is such an inflammatory um, disease and the rank LOPG pathway is part of the T, uh, TNF, uh, is, is a TNF molecule. TNF alpha inhibitors may um, help here, but just looking at good old fashioned cryotherapy, um, we're using cryocuff, which is just a, like a, a, a bladder that's filled with ice water, uh, but the foot doesn't contact the water, it only gets put into the, into the, the, uh, the bladder, and, and cooling the foot down, and maybe just, maybe just cryotherapy is gonna make a difference. Uh, we're not really sure how frequent to do this. Uh, right now we're doing it three times a day, 30 minutes. Uh, you don't want to do, do it too much because you can, uh, you actually will get um, a, a rebound effect if you, uh, if you cool too much. Um, the, uh, so now the treatments for sharp of foot really can be broken down into medical or surgical. On the medical side, um, we, we also break the sharp of foot into um, two categories. Uh, we don't, we, the, the international consensus recommended not using the terms acute and chronic any longer. You may hear people say, oh, somebody's got an acute sharp of foot or a chronic sharp of foot. The problem is both of those terms refer to time, and there's no definitive point at which somebody has an acute sharp of foot that it then becomes a chronic sharp of foot. Uh, but also, you can have a chronic sharp of foot and then get inflamed again and have an acute on chronic episode, and it makes things very confusing. And so what the international consensus recommended was to just say that it's either, um, it's either active or inactive. If it's active, it's actively inflamed. You see an increase in temperature. That helps you decide what to do. If it's inactive, then there's no increase in temperature and, and we can move to the more preventative phase. So in the active phase, we're looking at um, offloading, sometimes bisphosphonates. I'll show you a study that, sh sh that, 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 that actually um, suggests not to use bisphosphonates. Uh, intranasal calcitonin, bone stimulators have been studied, but there's not good data on that. And then inactive, um, we're, we're looking at mostly accommodated footwear. On the surgical side, either exostectomy or reconstruction. Uh, on the offloading, total contact cast versus removable cast walker. Uh, I'll just give you my personal opinion. Uh, you know, 90% of the problem with the removable cast walker is in a third of its name. It's removable, and, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, it tends to lead 
to uh, patients not uh, um, uh, being as compliant. So when we look at the data on this, uh, and this is what I want to point out, is um, that when patients are casted, they, uh, look at how long somebody had to be casted until their foot was quiet. 18 plus or minus 10 weeks. And I think that we do our patients and ourselves a disservice when somebody comes in and, um, and we think about this as a fracture or a dislocation, something more simple and somebody without complications, and you say, uh, okay, well, you're gonna be in this cast for six or eight weeks. Well, that's very unrealistic based on, on all of these studies, which show that it's almost half of a year that patients are being treated with a cast in order to, to correct their sharp of foot, uh, to, to bring it from, a, from an active to an inactive phase. So we need to be upfront with them, and, uh, and that'll help to you know, smooth things along as, as, uh, and, and you know, hopefully make them less angry with you when, you when you measure their temperatures again and say they need to still stay in the cast. Uh, I want to point this out. Uh, Dr. Latham had talked about how uh, it was, uh, you know, he, he did things the conservative way for a while and then the surgical way and, and had, had a lot of complications in both arms. Uh, well, when you, you know, if you look at conservative management, and I, and I don't really like that term uh, anyway when we talk about the Sharpo foot because it's a, this is a devastating uh, complication of diabetes that can lead to an amputation and frequently does lead to an amputation. There should be no conservative management of, a, of a, uh, a disease like that. Now, maybe that's just the, the use of the term, because um, I believe in using total contact cast and other things, so maybe surgical versus non-surgical would be a better, better way to phrase it. But in the non-surgical management of the sharp of foot, even, even non-surgically, 30% of them developed a contralateral sharp a recurrence, or a new ipsilateral attack. 31% uh, developed a foot ulcer in this study. So even when you're trying to do things as as uh, you know, uh, as, as carefully as possible uh, without surgery, you're still having a lot of complications. So that needs to be thought about when you're when you're thinking about surgery uh, in uh, in whether um, you know in in, uh, in in weighing the risks and benefits of surgery uh, because the risks there are, are risks of not doing surgery as well as I as I just pointed out. Uh, so in, a, in the largest sharp of foot audit, which was done, the CDUK study, uh, 288 sharp of foot patients, 36% recalled some type of trauma, 12% the trauma was actually a surgery they had on their index limb within the past six months. So the surgery itself, whether it's a bunion or something like that, actually caused the inflammation which led to the sharp o. And, uh, and the use of non-removable offloading, so this is the removable cast walkers, or the use of non-removable offloading, total contact cast, led to quicker resolution than the use of removable offloading. And then uh, the use of bisphosphonates actually led to longer resolution than, uh, than not. So, um, so that's why the, the, uh, uh, the Joint Task Force did not recommend the use of bisphosphonates. Uh, and, and in fact, we said available pharmacologic therapies have little evidence to promote the healing of sharp neuropathy. Um, the, uh, on the surgical side, we can either do something that is uh, simple, uh, moderate, or complex. The simplest thing to do is just to address the Achilles tendon. Moderate would be to address the Achilles tendon and um, remove the excess doses. Uh, and then complex is, is a complete um, reconstruction. So the indications for, for um, sharp of foot reconstruction is a non-healing um, foot ulcer or impending ulceration. Osteomyelitis is actually an indication for a surgery, not a, not a contraindication. Some people will look at this and they say, oh, I'm not gonna do surgery on this sharp of foot. There's like, they have an osteomyelitis. Well, that's a reason to do a sharp, sharp of foot surgery, to remove that osteomyelitis and do it. And, uh, and so defining an acceptable result, you wanna have a, uh, a stable plantar grade foot after surgery. So looking at this patient with a, uh, uh, with a sharp of foot here, these are, the, are x-rays that was taken in another doctor's office when the patient came in with a hot swollen foot but was not offloaded. And only one month later, here's a complete dislocation and, uh, um, of the foot. And, uh, and you can see a break in the tail of first met angle and a reduction in the calcane inflammation angle. So addressing the Achilles tendon, um, removing the bone, I, I, we saw a, uh, here's a, a nice, um, well this is isolating the neurovascular uh, uh, soft tissue structures on the dorsum and on the uh, plantar side, removing a wedge of bone, and you can see just, just uh, how much bone has to be removed to get back to healthy bleeding bone, and, uh, and this, is, this is how much here to get your wedge out. You make the foot a lot smaller, um, but you, have a, uh, you want to have good 
bone contacting with good bone. That's the only way you're going to get a good fusion. If you leave any bad bone in there, um, you're, you're going to be disappointed with the results. Uh, we sometimes use internal bone stimulation, not, not always. And then uh, do um, intraoperative x-rays, see that we're, we're correcting the angles. We, a lot of times we're using external fixation. Uh, this, is the, this is kind of the money shot here. Watch the foot wrinkle as, as the, these wires are being turned. That's, that's because you're getting compression across uh, the, the midfoot where the, the joint fusion is. So, uh, last slide is the, um, this is that's something that I did with, with Bijan as well. Does this really work? Same patient, preoperative on, uh, on the left, postoperative on the right. Um, this, is, this is six months after the operation. Uh, dynamic peak plantar pressure, so you can see restoring the pressure onto the heel and onto the forefoot from, uh, from the midfoot. So, thank you very much. Thank you.